Welcome to The Way. We want to help you connect, grow, and serve. Actually, we want to help everyone connect, grow, and serve. Would you take out your phones and share The Way's live stream on your Facebook page? Let's make sure that everyone has a chance to be a part of what God is doing at The Way. Our Justice and Mercy Ministry will be meeting today in the sanctuary after the 11 a.m. service. Everyone is welcome, so feel free to stick around. The follow-up team will be meeting in the cafe area after second service. If you signed up for the follow-up team at the ministry fair, please join us today. Showers of Blessings will begin again this fall. Showers of Blessings is our ministry to our houseless loved ones in the community. We provide toiletries, clothes, and showers. We will begin collecting new and gently used sleeping bags for our next Showers of Blessings event. So please bring any new or gently used sleeping bags to the church to donate to the cause. And now, everyone, let's get ready for Back to Church Sunday. Next Sunday, September 15th, is Back to Church Sunday. This is a great chance to invite a friend, a co-worker, or a family member to visit The Way. We will have a special team-taught sermon, some fun giveaways, and lots of things to make it fun and welcoming. Take a moment and think of a friend that you could invite, or someone from work, maybe even someone you just haven't seen at The Way for a while. A personal invitation can make a big difference. And remember to offer to come together or meet them here. It can be intimidating to come to a new church, so let's do everything we can to make it easy for our friends to get here. We have great flyers, so take a bunch with you and use them as invitations. Don't let people miss out on a chance to grow and experience God and be a part of the way next Sunday for Back to Church Sunday. And last but not least, let's take a moment to celebrate our kids. Did you know that every Wednesday and Saturday, kids from The Way gather to learn music as part of The Way's band class? They learn music theory and how to play an instrument. Let's take a moment to celebrate their progress. kids here at The Way. If you want more information about music classes, you can talk to Mother Loretta. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Amen. We are uh, going to go to the lectionary passage today, Deuteronomy chapter number 30. Uh, again, I hope that next week for Back to Church Sunday, everybody is preparing to bring all of your friends and your comrades. We're really hoping that uh, we'll pack out both services next Sunday. Uh, we're gonna give uh, free gift cards to people who bring the most folks to church. Amen, amen. So you can take them out to eat and maybe get yourself a little something. And so just use your imagination, amen, of how many people you can bring to get you enough money to, amen, bless them and yourself with some food. And then bring them, somebody say amen. And uh, we're going to bless everybody with a T-shirt that comes to church for 9 a.m. and 11 o'clock service. So I'm hoping that all of us take one of these cars that are on the chairs around us and we invite somebody to come back to church with us. Try to find somebody who hasn't been to church in a long time for a lot of reasons. And I tell them we got the dopest church for you. We promise these folk ain't pretentious and hung up and hypocritical and haters. We just some good peoples. We don't care what you have on, although we, you know, my, my, my daughter tried to wear some Daisy Dukes to church this morning, and I told her, girl, get your tail in those. <laughs> so we have some limits up in here, man. Uh, but uh, anything short of Daisy Dukes, you'll be all right out the way, man. Uh, all right, uh, here we go. Deuteronomy chapter number 30 is where we're heading. Um, and uh, we will uh, 
spend this time looking at uh, the text that is indeed uh, one of uh, my most favorite passages of scripture. It certainly is reminding us of a very most important and powerful lesson about uh, the power of our choices. And uh, uh, the book of Deuteronomy is one of the anchor books of the Torah in the Jewish scriptures. It is the first five books of the text that or of the Bible that helps to really tell both a narrative of the kind of origins of not just uh, the theological explanation of the world, but also it is seeking to give us a deep sense of a moral framework uh, of, of, of history and, and, and God's activity with God's people. How many of you know that uh, God has been in relationship with you before you knew you were in relationship with God? Mm -hmm. Man, I'm already on a tangent already. Amen. I think that's important because, you know, many of us, we, we, we want to believe that we initiate our relationship with God. When in reality, God has been reaching out to you since before you were born. And one may argue that, you know, uh, God was the one that actually started everything off. Uh, God, you know, deposited a, 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 a uh, uh, a human destiny, your destiny within the DNA of, of, of the, the person that would eventually become you, and God's not through with you yet. And, and, and God figures out a way to inhabit all of your choices and all of your decisions. And again, I, I already mentioned this, it would be great for all of y'all to check out Pastor Erna's sermon. She preached a great message on Psalms 139 this morning that came out of our lectionary as well. And, uh, and I think that all of it together, hopefully this week, gives you a great sense of God's intentionality of creating you, who you are, how you are. And uh, the rest of our life then is how do we live up to God's greatest imagination uh, when God created us from the beginning. And so uh, the first five books of the, of the biblical text is really about God attempting to give us some, 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 some markers, some, some boundaries, if you will. And uh, I think these boundaries will help us. So Deuteronomy chapter number 30, we'll take a look at this passage and, and, uh, and see what the text says to us in the name of the Lord. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. This sense that there is a word from the Lord, a certain kind of instruction. Some in theological circles call this natural law. These ideas that don't necessarily have to be revealed. They are a part of our constitution, our conscience, if you will. Uh, and yet, how many of you know you can know the good and still not do the good? <laughs> Man, uh, <yeah>. Verse number 15. <laughs> see, everybody say, see? see. I, and this is Moses talking to the children of Israel. This is not God talking. This is Moses talking to the children of Israel. I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, Walking in God's ways, observing God's commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are in entering to possess. Verse 17 says, but, everybody say, but, if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, 
I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. Verse 19, and I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying God, holding fast to God, for that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So I'm going to speak from the title, Life Choices That Save Our Lives. Life choices that save our lives. Bow your heads with me. God, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has been read for us. The people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Now to start this sermon off, I, 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 I love this, this movie, particularly when I talk about choices because it, it gives you at least a little bit of another hook to hang on in your mind, the power of choosing poorly, the power of choosing why Any Indiana Jones fans in the house, amen? All right, that's about 10 of y'all, so I know I'm getting old, amen? But the whole point is that while every choice you make might not be as consequential as the brother that, poor, that chose poorly, how many of you know that many of the choices we make do indeed add up to lead to either a deathly existence or a heavenly existence? Uh, I was uh, reading some C.S. Lewis for another thing that I was preparing for another talk and I ran across this old quote uh, that C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity. I think I ha might have that on the screen as well. He says that every time you make a choice you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different than it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices, all your life long you are slowly turning this central thing into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature. Either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and loneliness. Each of us at each moment of our lives is progressing to the one state or the other. The power of our choices. I uh, am very much... Uh, captivated by this idea that our choices through life, the art of choosing, because I have found that uh, my choice making, my decision making is hopefully better the older I get, but it is not guaranteed. That often my choices are uh, uh, a collection of of, of me learning through uh, self-discovery, learning through the wisdom that is passed down to us uh, from others with equal or perhaps superior uh, uh, kind of reflection, or my learning is, you know, by my own experience. It's by prayerfully you uh, uh, reading a book or two or going to a therapy session or two, or, or you just not listening to yourself all the time because in as much as uh, you are wise you are that wise 
where you can't learn something from someone else. This idea that every choice is equal, but not every choice is consequential. Uh, every choice you make is available to you, but not every choice has the same kinds of consequences. When I talk to the young people, uh, particularly those caught up in cycles of drugs or violence, I often talk to them about what does it mean for you to take seriously this idea that you pulling a trigger may have a lifelong choice or a lifelong consequence that you may not be ready for today. Mm -hmm. I was in San Quentin one time talking to some fellas and uh, one of the young, yeah, well he, he's not young anymore, he's probably in his 50s or so, he'd been serving a 30 year life sentence for uh, shooting someone when he was 16 years old. And he said, you know, it wasn't until my 10th year where I began to realize the weight of my choice. He said, if I could go back to my 16-year-old self, I'd tell him, stay at home. Don't get in the car. Yeah. Have you ever looked back over your life and be like, boy, if I could go back to my younger self, I wish I could talk to somebody today. Yeah, I, know, I know a whole bunch of y'all made every decision the right time the first time. But for me, I can think at least five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Can I get a 13 up in here somewhere? Amen. That's just like if, if I could go back in time with what I know today. I would make a different choice because while I made a million choices in my life, there's probably a few of them that had a outsized impact on who I am today. Well, child of God, could it be that one of the great opportunities you and I have is to figure out how do I make the right choice when Life and death is before me. Good and evil, opportunity or loss. How can I make sure that when I choose, I'm choosing in ways that are bringing me life, my family life, my community life, rather than me continuing to make decisions that force me to take 20 years to realize, man, I wish I wouldn't have made that choice. Now the challenge and the sad thing for many of us is that we don't get second and third chances for every choice we make. That there's some high stake choosing that you and I have to do, your choices every day may not necessarily be that high stake, but how about when you vote? High stake choice. <laughs> I might say amen. If you don't vote, high stake choice. People say, oh, Pastor Robert, why are you doing all this stuff with all this political stuff, trying to get people to vote? Because we found out that a lot of folk didn't vote last time. And we found out that a lot of people who wanted to vote couldn't vote because they did so much voter suppression. Then we found out that folks who did vote got their votes thrown out because of voter fraud. And all of that together, coupled with the Russians and all these other evil stuff, created such a small margin of, 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 of error that we got the, the president we have now. And it's taken us two and a half years to realize how the decision not to vote, not just impacting you personally, but your family and, dare I say, the world. Oh, Pastor, that's too big. How about your decision not to go to work? <laughs> oh, Y'all look like, I don't know, I voted. You ain't talking to me. <laughs> your decision not to turn in your paper 
not to go to the club that night, to tell him or her to go home. Somebody say amen. You wish you'd have kept your phone number in your pocket. I wish I never gave them my number. <laughs> 10 years of my life gone. I knew I'd get a response out of that one, amen. Mm -hmm. Choices. And yet you and I are given criteria that can help us choose wisely. The question you and I have to ask ourselves, why is it that even though we know the good, we can't always do the good? As Paul says in uh, Romans 7, that I know what to do. I've memorized the law, memorized the list, but there's something inside me that keeps me from doing the right thing. Do I have a witness here today? Amen. Mm -hmm. There's some a little internal battle going on. What if I told you that you did not have to struggle alone to make the right choices? That God has given you and I what we need so our choices do not disqualify us, or better word, does not delay God's best. Because I'm one of these people who believes if God has the best for you, you got to work pretty hard to outrun or outlast God's best because of your bad choices. You just may, instead of you experiencing it when you're 20, you may experience it when you're 50. You spend 30 years like, oh, <laughs> come on, I can't get this right. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them these choices saved my life. Tell them that these choices saved my life. What, 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 what are some of these choices? Well, Moses, listen, Moses just led the children out of Egypt, out of their place of bondage, on their way to the promised land. The children of Israel prayed, Lord, deliver us, take us out. God did it, and they rebelled as soon as they got free. The scripture says that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. A 40-year journey that should have took 40 days. Say that again. Their inability to choose well didn't take the promised land from the children of Israel. It just meant that rather than a 40-day journey to the promised land, 40 years. God had to work some things out in the children of Israel before they could get to the promised land. Why? Because you can get a good thing and not know how to take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> Stop talking to somebody today. I'm talking to me. Yeah. Then you, 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 be, you, you, you be wondering... God, why you bless me with this good thing and I'm not ready? God says, okay, well, next time I'm just going to hold out. Help you wander. Now, you know, it's important to qualify the wandering because they didn't wander without direction. God led them, Scripture says, through a pillar of fire in the nighttime and a pillar of clouds in the daytime. So their GPS was a little different, but the GPS kept them from wandering in a lost direction. The GPS caused them to wander in a focused direction. And I do believe that some of our wandering is about God getting us ready, teaching us some lessons that we haven't learned yet. You know, um, there are all kinds of reasons why people take longer to learn things. But I worked, we worked, some of us worked in the schools where they just pass people along, even though they didn't learn what they were supposed to learn. Amen. And even though the child and even some of the parents Felt like it was better to pass them along. Just let them stay with their class. 
By the time we enter in ninth, tenth, eleventh grade, they can't read, write, add, subtract, divide. Them being passed along did not help them the way they had thought it would. In our desire to keep moving forward, don't, uh, don't, 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 don't get anxious when God puts the brakes on your progress. Because you have not yet learned what you're supposed to learn in this grade of life. Because how many know there are some situations where you can't fake what you don't know? <laughs> Things that I believe the text lifts up to us that can help us. First thing is you and I have to choose to love. Everybody say choose to love. love. The scripture says, listen, uh, if you obey... By loving the Lord. Now, when we talk about choosing to love in the Christian context, it is critical for us to remember that our love must always be grounded in God's love to us. Because there are all kinds of loves out here in the world. I love the 49ers when they win it. <laughs> uh. But when they're not winning, I, you know, I still like them and everything, but I'm sure not going to sit out there paying for watch a loser. <laughs> so my love for the Niners is conditional. How many of you have thrown out the things you love? Oh, I love this, I love that, till it's not working for you, then it's all, I hate your guts. I hate that, I hate you. Yeah. That, that, that is not the kind of love that we are called to live into. So we must start with loving God. What does it mean to love God? If you love God, you'll love everything that God created. Love grounded in a love from God helps you and I, listen, to learn how to love that which you don't like. Learning to love the Lord your God Love produces life. If you love God and everything that God creates, that will produce life. If you don't love God and everything that God creates, it will produce death. Now, it's really important for you to, I, to appreciate the process of learning how to love because it's easy to love that which you like. At least you think it is till you get it. And I tell couples all the time, you get to choose who you love, but then you have to learn to love your choice. And both of those processes are two totally different journeys. And I'm not going to talk on that. We're going to save that for blessed be the ties that bind our hearts. But Bell Hooks, she says it like this, that the dominator culture has tried to keep us all afraid to make us choose safety instead of risk. Sameness instead of diversity. Moving through that fear, finding out what connects us, reveling in our differences, this is the process that brings us closer, that gives us a world of shared values, of meaningful community. Love pushes through difference. Love helps us to overcome that which the world, the enemy, constructs to divide us. Love that comes from God helps to bridge gaps. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, keep watching on the screen because I know we hear these passages a lot, but, but I, 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 I want you to imagine how does this passage inform how you define love because again, a lot of us think that love is about feelings when actually love is about our commitments. How committed can you be to the process of transformation that comes by an act of love God extends to us and then thereby we are called to extend to others. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is patient. 
can you and I choose to be patient as a result of our love? Somebody say, help me, Lord. Love is kind. You want to be kind to them? This for me. Because there's some folk, I, 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 one, two, three, four, five. You know, I perfected the art of ignoring people. Anyone, anyone got that art? Like you sit in a meeting and you just act like they ain't even there. <laughs> they sitting right there and you just. How I many know that's not kind? Someone told me it's kind because if I look at them, it's about to be some chairs moving up in there. Somebody say amen, right? Ain't that something you talk yourself into it? So, so I'm saving them, God. <laughs> oh, let me keep reading. It does not envy. Love's not a hater. Love's not jealous. Enviness. It was enviness a word? Envy. En uh, that word is a result of this sin our own internal discontent. You're only envious of folk based off of your discontent of yourself. Because real talk. <laughs> um, it's none of your business what they have. How they got it. Now, you know, in, in, in a strict, strictly narrow sense, I cannot be envy of people and love them at the same time. It taints my love. That love leads to bitterness. And bitterness leads to conflict. Conflict, when taken all the way out, uninterrupted, leads to harm and death. Oh, how did you stop liking them? So why are you so why why they trick you so much? And it goes all the way back to envy for some folk. Let me keep reading. Love's not envy. It does not boast. So, you know, I'm just giving you a description of some love from God's perspective, not the love you got from as the world turns and days of our lives and young and the restless. Love Jones, somebody say amen. Love in basketball. I'm trying to give y'all some descriptions. Uh, meet Joe Black, praise God. Any Meet Joe Black folks in the room? Man, that was a good movie. Y'all missing out on Meet Joe Black now. <laughs> Love does not boast, it is not proud. Listen, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Lord, is this in the Bible? It keeps no record of wrongdoing. Lord, save me from myself. Because how many know we can all be petty? Amen. I'm, uh, around certain things, I'm not petty. I don't really care. But certain things, I am the pettiest Negro you've ever met. <laughs> I mean, I hold a grudge now. Around certain things. Other things, like, I don't care. You know, call me a name. I don't care. Just don't put your hands on me. You know, we have to do. I believe in nonviolence, just don't push me. Somebody say amen, right? <laughs> but 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 if 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 you are causing harm to people on the basis of human hierarchy, I can get pretty petty when you're trying to interrupt the work of liberation that many of us are invested. I can get pretty petty and I don't know, I really, I really like wanna do something to you. Yeah. Ain't that something? The things that live inside of you that are trying to do right, that you can be so zealous for a thing that your zeal can drive you to betray the very thing you're fighting for. That's why love has to be the condition, the ground by which you act for everything. Mm -hmm. I forgot about the love don't keep record of wrongs. Amen. I'm going to have to. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Listen, love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Love never fails. 
love. Choosing to love with that robust list is a lifelong endeavor. We don't master choosing to love like that. We are constantly students of the one who did. And the one who did put the spirit of God inside each and every one of us. That same spirit that causes you to speak in tongues, swing from the chandeliers and roll on the floor. It's not a different Holy Ghost. It's the same one that teaches you how to love like that. So, first question I want you to wrestle with, how does love for God translate into life-giving choices for you and others? Can you love in a way that allows your love for God be just as life-giving for all of creation as God's love has been for you? For me. While I was still in my sins, God's love compelled God to come and see about me. How does our love radically change reality for those around us? Does our love, defined by 1 Corinthians 13, inform the ways we love God, we love ourselves, we love our neighbor, we love all of creation? First question. Second thing the scripture says that I think is worthy of our reflection, if we are going to focus on the choices that saved our lives, choose to heal. Choose to love. But you also have to make a choice to heal. Because none of us will go through life unscathed from the hardships of life. Mm -hmm. I, uh, well, the scripture, if your heart turns away and are led astray, you will perish. I, I found this verse speaking to me as it relates to healing because an unhealed person usually gets a hard heart. You become callous. And when you become callous, it's very difficult for you to feel almost anything. Healing is a choice. Everybody say that healing is a choice. Say it again, healing is a choice. Healing does not have a time uh, 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 stamp on it. It may take you forever to heal from certain things that have happened in your life. So there's not like, you know, healing out of expiration date. You must be healed by your 37th birthday. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm 43, and I'm still being healed from things that happened to me when I was 21, 22. And I got beat up by the cops. There are still moments right now where I cry and don't know why I'm crying. When I was in Ferguson, trauma impacts me so much where I can hear a door slamming, tears start falling. I break out in the cold sweats when I see tear, uh, tear gas on the TV. Trauma. And I've been to therapy. I still go to therapy. I'm on the road to healing. But I had to choose it. We must be invested in our healing or our heart turns hard. Listen, and we usually walk away from God because we get mad at God because God didn't fix it the way we thought God should or we thought God would. You ever pray? It's like, God, fix it, fix it, fix it, and don't get fixed. He's like, man, forget you, God. <laughs> Is that just me? I only pray that kind of prayer? Hey man, you know, like Smokey and, and Friday, it's like Debo walks up to him and be like, you know, what'd you say? I'm going to say nothing. This Smokey talking about, see, I got a mind trick, you know, when, when, when he come up, you know, I stop talking, but when he leaves, I talk again. That's how, that's how some of y'all think y'all prayers is with God. 
you in your prayers. Oh, thou God of creation, he makers of heaven and earth, when the earth shook, yo, you just, you know, sent lightning and the hurt, the thunder roll and the lightning flash, and that's how you pray. Then when you get done, Jesus' name, amen. Man, I hate God. And you be thinking like, well, at least I'm not praying. No, God understands. God hears your deepest frustrations. But choosing to heal means that you stay in the conversation. There are times when I was in my therapy sessions, I didn't think therapists understood anything. And, you know, a few times they didn't. But I learned the process was less about my therapist and more about me. The process of healing. Why is this so important right now? It's important because I do believe we are a people being gaslit and triggered every day by our politics, by our families, by our conditions. And if you opt out of healing because your heart gets hard and your life gets bitter, you will not, listen, when the gaslighting ends, you will still be caught in the gaslighting cycle. That storm was only meant for six months and the six months has ended and you still in there three years later because you did not invest in your healing along the way. Uh, my time is leaving me. But what factors turn your heart away from life with God? Uh, unforgiveness. Now, forgiveness has become such a fascinating, overused, cheap word. But I, I, I'm going to preach a whole message on forgiveness maybe during our blessed be the ties that bonds or one of us will. But let me just say this. You and I must learn to forgive if we will be healed. Because holding on to unforgiveness and bitterness is like you having glass in your hand and squeezing it. Talking about, oh, I'm not going to let this go. Meanwhile, the other person, you know, that's going on with their life, probably hurting other people. They ain't thinking about you. They, 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 <laughs> they, they, they did what they came to do with you. They done moved on because hurting people hurt other people. Somebody say amen. So don't think they, they fixated on you. They did what they came to do. So you pray for them. Pray for God to put them, lay them down in a green pasture somewhere. Give them a timeout so they can figure out how to stop hurting folk. But you holding on to the hurt. Every time you see him, God's like, man, let, let that go. No, I'm going to hold on to it because I ain't no punk. <laughs> Blood dripping down your hand, scarring up your tissues, holding on to something. That God is saying, I can heal you from that. If they never say sorry, I can heal you from that. If they keep hurt, I can heal you from that. But you got to let it go. Am I helping anybody today? Amen. I'm, 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 I'm. Choosing to heal is hard. It is hard. It is hard because, you know, that's not how we are all wired. We're wired for revenge. We're wired for, for pettiness. Some of it, if we got real deep, is about defense trying to make sure this don't happen to me again. But you can be defending yourself and harming yourself at the same time. Oh, I got to keep moving. Last thing that I want to lift up, choose to be free. So listen, choose the love. Everybody say choose the love. Choose the heal. Everybody say choose the heal. And then you got to choose to be free. Listening obediently to God. Firmly embracing God. Oh, yes, God is life itself. Choosing freedom in an age where liberation has become uh, liberation has become a cliche. You know, I was talking with some of my comrades. Not saying that any of us are like more revolutionary than anybody else, but we always be thinking, you know, it's fascinating how liberation has become monetized. You know, they kill prophets in the in the text. <laughs> Today, you know, you 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 got a million Twitter followers. I'm trying to figure out 
What are you saying that's so revolutionary where everybody agrees with you? Talk about self-deception. Amen. Choosing to be free is often about you making, I, we, making hard decisions about those systems and practices and beliefs that oppress us and others. And listen, uh, Augustine, you know, people talk about free will all the time, but my reading of Augustine is very different than most people's reading of Augustine because people feel like Augustine, you know, the North African church father who really wrote lots of the work on free will and informed Western theology, thinks that free will is about you getting, being able to choose whatever you want to choose. But my reading of free will is very different. You are not free if you cannot choose the right thing every time. Amen. Free will is not you being able to choose right or wrong. Free will, if you are really free, is about you being able to choose the right thing every time. When we don't make right choices, it is a reminder of how in bondage we really are. And I know many of us like to make litmus tests about the things that will make you free. And we focus on identity politics a lot, but we surely don't focus on the economy nearly as much. Can you imagine if we only let people come to church who did not live out capitalism? We was just as hung up on that as about who you sleeping with. We'd be in trouble. I know I would. Be like, oh, Jesus, but you know my heart. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. We pick and choose what we think God is obsessed about. When in reality, God is trying to help you and I make better choices with what God has placed in your hands. Because it is in our choosing. That life multiplies. It is in our choosing that life sustains. It is in our choosing that life begins a journey towards true freedom. Nelson Mandela, he says it like this. The truth is that we are not free. We have merely achieved, listen, the freedom to be free. The right not to be oppressed. We have not taken the final step of our journey, but the first step on a longer and even more difficult road. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. The true test of your devotion to freedom is just beginning. And I'm here to tell you today that God is trying to move some of us out of a place where we are obsessed with the terms and not with the practices. God wants you and I to be people who can move with freedom and with clarity and with a prioritization of our healing and our loving of one another. I want you to know that God is unlocking within some of us today a, a need and a desire to choose more rightly and more wisely every day not just the big decisions but the small ones uh, god is trying to get somebody to say as for me and my house we choose to serve the lord god's trying to get some folks to say i refuse to choose things that produce death all around me when i've been given an opportunity to choose things that bring life god's trying to get some of us to say i refuse to keep choosing you and them and him and her when i got an opportunity to choose the king of kings and the lord of lords the pathways that i know will bring me to my destination god is trying to get a church who's willing to say i refuse to choose oppression and power and violence when i've been called to choose a love that is patient and a love that is kind and a love that does not hate and a love that does not envy. God's trying to get somebody to say I refuse to keep choosing things that make me lay up in the bed at night trying to figure out how can I get out of
out of this situation. No, God wants you to choose something that helps you to be propelled toward your future. I choose to pray today. I choose to study today. I choose to serve today. I choose to be healed today. I choose to go in the direction towards my healing. And if you can make a right choice, I believe God will give you the strength to say no. I say no to that foolishness. I say no to that situation. I say no to that temptation. Because God, I choose the best you have for me. Somebody shout hallelujah. Choose, choose ye this day. Come on, stand with me. Choosing wisely versus choosing poorly. It'll save your life. It'll save a life around you. It'll redeem your past. It'll catapult you to your future. What must you do to choose? To learn to choose differently. Choose love, choose healing, choose freedom. Grab the hand of the person next to you. God, I pray for the person I'm touching. You know the choices that I must make this week. You know the choices they must make this week. Lord God, as we were told in our 9 a.m. service, Lord, you knew us, you stitched us, you, you, you knitted us together. Lord, with all of the most necessary pieces, but God, there are things that have attached themselves to us that we must choose today to let go of. So I pray today, God, that as I choose to love you and all creation, teach me how to love myself. Teach me how to love others around me. God, as I choose to be healed, may I invest in my healing and not just my destruction. May I take the steps necessary to reevaluate how I use my time in this season of being in school or being on this particular job or in this particular season of my life. Lord, may my time be a a, a recipe for healing. Put me in relationship with those, God, in my communities of concern that can help me be healed. Oh, and God, I pray that, Lord, you help me to choose freedom, the freedom to be able to make the right choice every time. Do what only you can do in me and the person I'm touching. And God, make it so, squeeze their hand gently, Lord. I squeeze into their hand everything they need. God, may my gentle squeeze be a representation of your consistent downloading of love and joy and peace and patience and love that is defined by your words and your descriptions. And God, I pray you'll give them what they need. Lift those hands right where you're standing. God, it's me, Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister nor my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. I need you to heal me. I need you to teach me. I need you to deliver me. I need you to sustain me. I need you to be my helper. I need you to be my bridge. I need you, God, to give me what I need for this season and this assignment. I pray, God, that as I lift my hands to you, you'll take away everything that should not be. Take away the bitterness. Take away the lingering, Lord God, doubt and anger and fear and pain. Take it away. And in its place, God, put in me a clean heart. Renew the right spirit within me. Help me, Lord, to listen to you, to obediently follow your directions so I can live in the land that you promised to our ancestors. Remind me, God, that I am greater than just who I am today, but God, I stand in a long line of faithfulness. God bless, do it, heal it in Jesus' name. 
we pray. Come on, take a few moments and just thank God in advance. In advance, I thank you. I thank you. Hug two or three people. Tell them I'm learning to choose wisely. Tell them that I'm learning to choose wisely.